of next Monday. We will put them out when they're finished. We'll put the exams out um, in uh, uh, a bookshelf or, or shelves that are in the faculty corridor in the art uh, in, the, in the building upstairs, where we uh, return exams and papers and things like that, and they'll have the number of the course, so you can check up there if you want to. But I'll announce on Tuesday if they are um, ready. Also, I wanted to r remind you about the uh, paper proposals. Uh, if you remember the um, in the syllabus, it's uh, when it talks about uh, writing a paper. If you want to write a paper. It's, uh, you, uh, you should um, give me a proposal of the topic, and that can be very uh, brief, just a, a, a sentence or a few sentences, uh, just so I know what it is that you're proposing doing, with some indication that you've uh, uh, looked at the bibliography or found, uh, found enough bibliography that you know that it's a feasible topic and that you can get some information about it. And so indicate that as well. And. Um, on the syllabus, it said uh, that uh, that should be turned into me by the middle of the quarter, which is now, of course, or we're actually past it a little bit, maybe. So get that to me as soon as possible, uh, uh, certainly sometime next week, um, because then I'll look at it and see if I think it's a feasible topic. If I have any suggestions, I'll make notes of that and get it, get them back to you. But you do have to give me a proposal if you're writing a paper. A cancellation of the um, of Tuesday's uh, class last week put the uh, lectures behind a bit, of course, and I uh, tried to figure out just how to do that. Whether I would uh, struggle to try to keep up with the uh, the syllabus, and I've uh, decided uh, basically to sort of cool it and uh, not to get uh, too uh, uh, anxious about. Um, Keeping exactly to the, to the syllabus, and if we don't get through the entire syllabus, well, that's that's okay. I think maybe it's more important that we deal with things in uh, in the pr at the proper pace and not uh, rush too much. I also like to to leave some time at the end of classes to for a little discussion when that's possible. And so I've just decided not to feel that I have to include everything that's on the syllabus or on on those handouts or in the, even in the study uh, set of images. And so if there's something that's not covered in class, uh, either individual uh, uh, buildings or designs, or at toward the end, if we just don't get to the, uh, the final material that's on the syllabus, you just won't be responsible for that. And we'll just, uh, I think it makes more sense just to, um, just to take things at a, uh, what seems to be a proper pace, leave time for, for some discussion. Okay, uh, let's have the first slides. Remember, uh, in the last uh, lecture, we were looking at um, the work of uh, Frederick Law Olmsted and then uh, Henry Hobson Richardson. Uh, pro the two of them probably the most important figures in late 19th century American design. Not necessarily the most successful architects. We'll be actually looking at a couple of architects today who, uh, or at least uh, yeah, a couple, I guess, who. Um, Maybe, strictly speaking, were more successful as far as the practices uh, went. But in terms of their significance and their ultimate influence, I think certainly Olmsted and, and, and Richardson are the great figures of late 19th century American design. Olmsted, of course, in landscape design, broadly defined. here at Stanford, or in a sense we do. The original master plan of the campus, uh, designed by Olmsted, as we saw, and we see over there again that uh, bird's eye uh, uh, lithographic view of the, um, of the design that was uh, done in 1888. Olmsted working along with uh, Leland Stanford himself, who had a large, um, a contra made a large contribution to the design. And the actual buildings of the quad, the architecture per se, designed by Richardson's young associate, uh, Charles Coolidge, since Richardson himself had just uh, died, but in the style of Richardson, very clearly. Uh, for example, Memorial uh, Church, especially in its original form before the tower fell down in the 1906 earthquake, based 
quite clearly on uh, Richardson's Trinity Church in Boston, which we, um, which we looked at a bit. And I, I want to show a couple more uh, works by Richardson himself, but first, I want to look at another Stanford building uh, before we uh, depart from Stanford, a building that I included in the study set of, of images that are online with, included with the other uh, uh, slides of Stanford architecture, but neglected to uh, include it in the, in the handout. And it's the, uh, the Stanford Museum, which I'd like to look at um, just for a, a couple of minutes now. Uh, if you don't know the Stanford uh, Museum, go s see it sometime, at least from the outside. It's closed now, of course, because it was damaged in the uh, uh, 1989 earthquake and is uh, uh, presently being um, being repaired and expanded. Uh, it's going to uh, will be wonderful when it uh, when it opens. It's on the if you don't know it, it's uh, it's on the uh, the west side of Palm Drive. So go over and see it at least from the outside sometime. Well, it's one of the um, the, the, the museum here is one of the original Stanford buildings built starting uh, around 1890, like the um, uh, inner quad buildings. But it was not designed by Coolidge, and um, and it looks very different, of course, from the um, from the quad buildings. Uh, so it's in in that sense architecturally sort of an anomaly, and it's off by itself. It was not part of the original uh, design that we see on the left there for the uh, for the for the central buildings lay, uh, planned by uh, by Olmsted. So it's um, it's rather it has an anomalous kind of relationship to the uh, to the rest of the original architecture here. Nevertheless, it's uh, an important building architecturally. The main reason that it's different from the quad buildings and set apart is that it was the special project of Jane Stanford, who had uh, somewhat different interests in architecture from, um, from her husband, Leland, as I suggested, I guess, briefly last time. Uh, Leland uh, focusing on planning the quad with Olmsted and, and, and Coolidge. And if he had been in charge of the museum, it um, uh, probably would have been in the, that same kind of Richardsonian Romanesque uh, style. It might have even been part of the uh, the, uh, the buildings in these uh, quads that were being uh, proposed for the central part of the campus. But but Jane Stanford took charge of planning the museum. It was really her special project, her special memorial to um, to their son Leland Jr. And she worked on it with uh, with an architectural firm from San Francisco. So different architects were involved and, and engineers, and I'll get back to the engineering in a moment. And uh, the building is significant, the museum building, in, um, in several ways. Uh, for example, it was one of the largest museums uh, in America when it was built, and this, uh, the style of it, this classical style, is of interest. But most important architecturally, and what I really, uh, the, the reason I mainly want to include uh, the building here and talk about it a bit, most important architecturally is the way it's built, the, the actual material that's used, uh, which is um, reinforced concrete, a new material at this time in uh, architecture. So I thought this was a good point to say something about reinforced concrete, which um, became perhaps the most widely used material in, in modern architecture and, and still is uh, today, certainly steel, and reinforced concrete are the two main materials used in in modern architecture, at least on a on a on a large scale. If you don't if you put uh, domestic architecture aside, which I guess is still mainly wood, uh, steel and reinforced concrete are really the materials of modern architecture. The Stanford Museum is one of the first um, major buildings, not just in America but in the world, uh, built out of this material. Uh, <coughs> Well, what is, um, what is reinforced concrete? There are two parts, uh, the, the concrete and the reinforcing part. Concrete alone is um, a mixture of uh, several ingredients, crushed limestone, uh, sand, gravel, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, s some additional ingredients, and uh, then mixed with water, poured usually into a form of some sort, and then when it's dried, it... Um, it really is like stone. Concrete was uh, used by the ancient uh, Romans, but then uh, in the later periods in, uh, in European architecture, it uh, 
was pretty much forgotten or wasn't used much. It began to be experimented again in the uh, 19th century, and the term that was often used when it was first, uh, when it was um, used in the, in the uh, 19th century was artificial stone, because it really is like stone, but it can be created in, these very, in very large uh, um, uh, uh, masses of it, large, large volumes, of course, since it's just uh, poured, and then becomes monolithic or stone-like after it's, um, when it's dry. The problem with uh, this material that people began thinking about when they started using it again in the 19th century was that, uh, that like stone, concrete is very strong in compression, but not in tension. And so it could, uh, at first it was only used for, uh, for walls that, that uh, could support themselves and, and mainly had just compression and, di and didn't need to be strong in tension, or it's sometimes used for, for pavements and, and, f and floors. And in fact, if you go through the, um, the arcades in the inner quad and look down at the, at the, at the pavement and that's uh, made in those uh, uh, kind of diamond-shaped um, uh, patterns, you'll see uh, stamped in it every now and then a, um, uh, a manufacturer's stamp or the contractor's stamp, and it's actually called artificial stone. It was um, some patent patented by the maker, the particular type that was used, and it was and it's called artificial stone. The um, but uh, toward the end of the 19th century, uh, engineers and builders began to um, uh, realize that there could be a solution to this this problem of uh, that uh, that concrete was not. Um, really all that strong so when it needed to be used in tension. And this, um, it was really a brilliant solution, which was to combine the compress compressive strength of concrete with the tensile strength of iron or steel. And that's the reinforcing part. So that's where reinforcing comes in. And there were various techniques for doing this at first. It's kind of a complicated story, which I won't get into. But basically, we see uh, uh, the, the pattern, the main uh, kind of system that, that developed in uh, succeeding years. This is a, a, a diagram of the uh, system developed by a French engineer at, in around 1890, which was when a lot of these um, innovations were being um, uh, made. And uh, basically, the way it uh, was done and is still done uh, is that uh, forms are made uh, uh, usually out of wood. And then reinforcing bars, and you see them here, are placed inside those forms. Sometimes they have to be uh, t t wired in in certain ways to hold them in the right place because they're care it's carefully determined where these bars should be to, um, to correspond with where the t uh, tension is needed uh, for, for where the structural forces uh, um, require uh, uh, material of high tensile strength. And then um, after that's done, the concrete is poured into these forms around the, uh, the bars. It's uh, uh, um, the uh, concrete is allowed to, to dry, uh, the uh, form boards are removed, and one has uh, uh, beams and uh, columns and, and beams and slabs, whatever one has created, that, have the, uh, that are, have, are very strong, both in compression and tension, combining these uh, two materials. And as a result, the spans, for example, between uh, columns can be much greater than they could be if they were stone columns. And today, of course, they can be much greater than indicated in that um, diagram by the French engineer Ennebique was his name. Well, uh, people immediately realized what uh, the potential, great structural potential for this uh, material. But at first, it was used um, almost exclusively for buildings like factories and, and, and warehouses, uh, uh, buildings that weren't considered really proper architecture. Uh, it uh, was um, considered something kind of low class or something that could only be used for that wasn't really an appropriate material for, um, for uh, uh, serious architecture, one might say, or proper architecture. And it was the, uh, these innovations were made of in, um, in England and, and by French engineers, but also in the United States. And the major innovator probably in reinforced concrete technology in America was a man named Ernest Ransom who actually practiced out of San Francisco. He originally came from England, but he had um, set up uh, his um, engineering firm in San Francisco in the late, uh, in the 1880s and 90s. And he made various uh, uh, technical advances uh, himself that were patented, uh, especially having to do with the reinforcing bars and how they would actually work and uh, various details about that. And around 1890, Jane Stanford and her advisors agreed to have Ransom construct the, the, the Stanford Museum 
using reinforced concrete for the entire building. This was mainly apparently in order to save time. She wanted to have the uh, museum uh, ready for the opening of the, uh, of the university, but nevertheless, it was a, it was a, a very bold and, and courageous uh, decision. And it was the first time, as I guess I suggested, that a major public building used this, uh, this, this new material. So in the history of reinforced concrete, the Stanford Museum is, is, is very important. And uh, one of those things that people, an interesting fact or something important that the people here don't really uh, generally know. Here's a, a photograph of the, uh, the museum being uh, uh, constructed. And um, you can see up, up here the form boards that uh, were built to, uh, for the concrete to be poured in up here. It's done, usually done in stages when you're building a building that's, that's tall like this or tall walls. It would be done in various stages. This part would be poured first. The uh, um, form boards would be built and then that would be allowed to dry and then the next part would be uh, added and it went up in, uh, in, in stages. Uh, so you get a sense of how, the, uh, how these forms are uh, uh, created. But um, so it's a very important building because of this, this material that was used here for the first time in a major kind of public way. But because concrete and reinforced concrete were not considered really proper materials uh, still a, at this time, it was um, felt necessary by the architects and I guess and by Ransom himself to disguise the uh, concrete and, and to make it look like stone. And in fact, Ransom uh, uh, devised uh, several special ways to do this. Uh, I have a couple of slides that uh, show this. Here, just another view of the museum from a different angle. Also includes some, uh, uh, some areas of, of mosaic, which were that special interest of uh, Jane Stanford. And, um, but if you look at the, at the, uh, uh, at the base of, of, of the building, the, uh, the foundation, you can see that, uh, that it looks as though these are blocks of stone. In fact, it looks like different types of stone that are handled in different ways. Uh, rusticated stone, as it's called, which is, has a, this uh, rough surface uh, versus smooth stone, and even some that has slight striations in this. It looks like different ways of handling stone, but all of that is just is done in concrete. This is all, this re all reinforced concrete, and it, Ransom actually went to uh, a lot of effort to figure out various ways that these different patterns that look like stone could be created in uh, concrete. For example, by exposing the aggregate uh, after the uh, concrete is, uh, is mostly dry but not completely dry, the, uh, the forms are removed and, uh, and some of the surface is, is brushed off to uh, expose the, uh, the, uh, the gravel underneath. And, uh, and he really devised these techniques which have become um, a sort of standard practice in the, um, in the handling of, um, of uh, concrete. But as a result, one can say that this is that the Stanford Museum and similar buildings like this, this is, was, became the sort of standard way that, that reinforced concrete was, was treated in public buildings for, for, for many years after so to make it look like stone, so to make it look uh, more respectable. But of course, it means it's not an honest expression of this uh, new material. And we'll return to this question uh, when we look at, um, at Frank Lloyd Wright's early work and his use of reinforced concrete, which was quite different. And he took a different approach toward this. But nevertheless, the Stanford Museum is a um, building of great historical uh, interest <coughs> that, uh, because of its, um, its importance in uh, architectural technology. However, I'd like to get, get back now to, um, uh, to Richardson, H.H. H. Richardson, for a few minutes before we move on and um, look at um, a couple more of his buildings. Remember, we looked at his Trinity Church in Boston and other buildings in which he used the, the Romanesque revival uh, in varying degrees, but then some in which he, the, the um, uh, revivalistic aspects uh, really were minimized to the point that, it, uh, that, uh, that the architecture really focused on those architectural issues of large, uh, of, uh, large arches and um, the, the strength of the walls. And let's look at another one of his buildings where, that, where the revivalism aspect has been reduced to almost uh, nothing. This I showed a, a one view of this uh, when we were beginning to look at Richardson's work, I think it was the one that I compared to uh, building by Frank Lloyd Wright. 
This is the Ames Gate Lodge, it's called, in a, a little town in western Massachusetts, northeastern Massachusetts, built around 1880. It's, um, it's a guest house and a kind of entry gate to a large estate. The, the main house on the estate is of, of uh, much less interest and was not designed by Richardson, actually. So it's, the, it's this gate lodge to this estate uh, of the Ames family that is, um, that's one of the great buildings of the late 19th century. And in fact, one enters the, uh, the estate, this is closer to the, to the road, and then one enters through this great arch. And uh, so you experience uh, the building, you actually go through this, uh, this building uh, to get onto the, uh, the property. Well, the building, it's, the overall building, as you can see, is uh, asymmetrical, and we could certainly say it's, it's picturesque, and it's uh, asymmetrical and irregular massing, and yet, it's a little different from the other, um, uh, most of the other picturesque buildings we've seen. It's, it's, uh, it's unified, we might say, by, um, by the materials, these uh, simple materials that have a kind of uniformity, and then the embracing roof, that roof that ties everything together. The walls, as you can see, are made, by, uh, uh, made up of rough boulders, uh, for the most part not dressed stone. That term dressed stone means uh, stone that's actually uh, squared off and, uh, and, uh, and given smooth surfaces or, or um, mostly smooth. And, but in, in fact, when we look more carefully, we see that, the, um, uh, that, the, that there's a, a kind of spectrum here of different degrees of roughness of the stone and, uh, and different types of stone that are used. And I think I have a um, detail that maybe shows that up a little a little more closely. There's really um, a whole range of type of, of stone treatment, and I think this is, this is one of the things that Richardson was interested in. Uh, as I mentioned before, he, he was fascinated with, with the basic qualities and, of, uh, and vocabulary of architecture, textures and, and, and mass and, and the way materials are dealt with, and different types of materials. And so here it's, um, he's, uh, he's a, uh, experimenting with or um, uh, displaying the different ways that stone can be used, uh, all the way from big r rough boulders that actually seem to maybe uh, uh, grow out of the ground or just they are the kind of boulders that might have actually been sitting on the site there, uh, up to, uh, to s smaller uh, rough uh, stones, but then to ones that are dressed in various degrees, either with a rough surface and then some of them have uh, uh, surfaces that are uh, a smoother surface. So there's this whole spectrum of the way stone can be treated. Also, there's a contrast that Richardson is making here in the, in the, uh, between the, the, the massiveness and this uh, rough texture of the walls and the thinness of the, of the roof. You can see these two things are almost the, uh, the opposite, the heaviness of the, the stone walls and the, and the lightness of this um, uh, tile roof and emphasize the, the, the thinness and the, and the lightness of the roof is emphasized by the actual design and the way uh, Richardson, the shape he gives it. So that, um, for example, it, it rises just gently over the, over the arch here to give that sense that it's a kind of membrane, so that it's some, something very thin, almost like a piece of paper that uh, can be uh, uh, laid over the, uh, the forms of the building. And then this little detail, which is so wonderful, this uh, little uh, eyebrow window, something that, is, uh, that might be called, uh, that um, looks really as though it's uh, uh, some kind of a slit, like made by, made by a razor, maybe slit in, a, in this thin membrane. And so all of these, these, these forms and the way it's being designed and, and uh, constructed uh, emphasizes these effects that, um, that Richardson wants to create. One wonders how much light that could actually, that window could actually let into the uh, space up, up there, but it's probably just an, an attic space used for storage. And it's really, he really wanted to do that, I think, not to create a window, but to, to show this little uh, slit so that it, uh, the, the, to emphasize the, um, uh, the thinness of that uh, plane in contrast to the, to the stone. Very typical of, uh, of, uh, of Richardson and the, um, and his uh, treatment of um, different materials. The, um, perhaps even more uh, influential than, uh, than the Ames Gate Lodge, which was a very, um, very uh, important and especially um, uh, impressed young architects around uh, at this time at the end of the, um, of the 19th century, people like Frank Lloyd Wright and other architects, and, and there's other, uh, many references to the Ames Gate Lodge in the work of uh, 
of the next generation of architects, which also suggests uh, or that um, I should m mention that uh, buildings at this time, at the end of the uh, 19th century, are now available of, to be studied by uh, other architects throughout America and even in Europe because they're being published much more. There are now architectural magazines in, in America. Uh, so information about buildings and photography, of course, can, is, uh, uh, is available in these uh, publications. So um, buildings like this become almost immediately of, uh, brought to the attention of uh, architects throughout America. But even more important than this building, uh, to American architecture in general, is a um, type of domestic house that Richardson pioneered in, though it was based partly on some things happening in, in England at the time. And it was first seen in Richardson's work in a house that we see here. It's called the Watts Sherman House in Newport, Rhode Island, built in um, in uh, the middle of the 70s, so it's actually earlier than the Ames Gate Lodge. And um, there are a number of um, important uh, aspects we could point out here. First of all, it uh, tends to be more horizontal than typical houses of the period. If you think of the types of, of upper class houses uh, we've seen, like the Italianate uh, and various types of the, the Gothic uh, revival, picturesque cottage and so forth, there tends to be often a uh, a very uh, uh, pronounced verticality. This is now more, uh, more horizontal. It's, it tends to be more unified. That large gable form that we see over on the, on the left there with the collects underneath it, all these different elements, windows banked together. It's there to, it all tends to be pulled together under, under, the, uh, under the large gable. And the plan is important. It's certainly, the, the house is certainly picturesque. It's still in that tradition of, of asymmetrical, uh, uh, picturesque, um, uh, design and the uh, floor plan itself you can see uh, shows uh, has, has this, this irregularity of, of rooms but many of them are open onto one another more than houses of the of the period here's one enters here into the uh, entryway there's a uh, large stair here but this is not a, a wall that goes up to the ceiling it's a little deceptive in this uh, floor plan this is all really open this is just the uh, the, uh, the wall that supports the uh, underneath the stairs and uh, this is all open and into this uh, hall, so it's a large open space. And um, if we actually look at the interior of another one of these houses, a, a similar house by uh, Richardson, we see, uh, get a sense of this openness and also the natural uh, uh, materials that Richardson uh, prefers. Uh, natural wood, he never liked to paint wood unless there was some reason he had to. But probably the most important thing, uh, what, and mainly what I wanted to point out about this house, is the materials that are used on the exterior. You can see there's a whole range of materials, uh, stone and brick and, uh, uh, and, and wood of various kinds, that uh, picturesque love of uh, irregularity and different materials. But the new element here is shingles. Uh, now we think of shingles as being so um, uh, ordinary or uh, common in uh, domestic houses of all types that it really comes as a bit of, of a surprise that until the end of the 19th century in houses like this in Richardson, shingles were considered, were not considered a proper uh, material for building a uh, respectable architecture. They were a rustic material that um, uh, might be used for sheds and, and, and barns, but uh, not in, uh, in proper architecture. And Richardson, I think, liked shingles and decided he wanted to start using them in his houses because of their distinctive qualities as a material. Again, his, his, um, his interest in the in inherent qualities of, of each architectural material. He liked the fact that they were natural and that they had a, a rough texture and that you didn't have to paint them. You could just leave the natural uh, wood of the, of the shingles. And also that they, when you created a whole wall or, or roofs of... Um, of shingles that they um, produced that thin kind of membrane-like quality uh, uh, that would uh, contrast to uh, the heavier materials. And so he really liked uh, shingles and he uh, tries using them here, you can see, for part of the wall. But then uh, later, in his later work, he um, designs houses that are completely covered with uh, shingles. And here's one of these houses in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's called the Stoughton House from the 1880s. And here you see the whole house here is, uh, is shingle.
one of the first buildings of what came to be called the shingle style that really swept American architecture in the 1880s and 90s and was one of uh, Richardson's uh, main legacies. Also, I might uh, suggest or point out that, um, that this uh, use of uh, shingles and these rustic materials by Richardson and others at this time may also have been to some extent an allusion to 17th century New England houses, some of those very early uh, uh, houses that uh, in some cases used shingles uh, as a uh, rustic available material. And there, at the end of the 19th century, there starts to be an interest in colonial American architecture and, and drawing on some of the, uh, almost kind of like a revival of some of those um, um, colonial buildings. So uh, all, there are all of these elements that kind of get summed up in this so-called shingle style. And because it swept the United States in the late 19th century, and of course that was the period when there was lots of building going on in the San Francisco area, we've, we can find uh, very good examples of the shingle style all around the Bay Area. Let me just show a couple of examples. Here's a, um, a group of houses that are all attached in San Francisco on Pacific Avenue uh, right next to the Presidio, built uh, in the 1890s and uh, in, I think into the um, uh, uh, first years of the uh, 20th century by uh, uh, several different architects. But it happens to be one of my favorite group of uh, buildings in, in San Francisco. There's this wonderful kind of informality about it. It's a very imaginative design, uh, imaginative compositions, these uh, buildings uh, that um, are clearly still uh, picturesque, as you can see, the asymmetry and the um, irregularity of the parts. The, the feeling that things are added, as though this was maybe built first, and then that this part was added, but it wasn't. It was all designed like that to start with. And the way that this uh, bay window is off-center, things don't quite line up. It's very, uh, it's this studied uh, informality, and it just happens to be done particularly well in this uh, group of houses in, on Pacific Avenue in San Francisco. But one finds it, uh, finds the shingle style in various forms all over uh, uh, the area. And in Palo Alto, this is a house on Kingsley uh, Avenue. Uh, probably built in the uh, in the 1890s. It's a little hard to date some of these things, but they're probably around around uh, uh, the 1890s and 1900. And this one also has a uh, a big arch in the uh, in this facade that suggests the arches of Richardson's work as well. It's uh, hard to um, overestimate um, the um, the importance of Richardson's uh, work in uh, at this time. This ha house in uh, in Palo Alto. Uh, has been painted, uh, I believe, uh, and one should not paint shingle-style houses. That's, uh, that's a mistake since they're, the whole point is that it's, they're supposed to have this rustic, natural quality. In, um, and in fact, in recent years, there's been a kind of revival, I think, of the shingle-style or reinterpretation of it by uh, architects, especially in the uh, kind of postmodern uh, uh, mode. And uh, once, so one sees new buildings uh, that seem to be drawing uh, on the uh, shingle style. Here's a uh, uh, clearly modern house. Uh, it's in Monterey and was designed uh, a couple of decades ago, I guess, by an architect named Charles Moore. But it still has, uh, it uses shingles. It has that irregular, almost picturesque kind of uh, uh, composition. And, um, uh, knowing Charles Moore, it's clear that he was consciously uh, drawing on these traditions of the earlier uh, American shingle style. Uh, other uh, contemporary examples of um, the revived shingle style can be found all around us, including here at Stanford uh, in some of the recent um, uh, student residences. Here's one, uh, Xanadu on, the, uh, on Mayfield Row. So. Um, so the shingle style in these, in these various forms, uh, whether um, uh, in, uh, of, uh, varying uh, of, uh, types and, uh, uh, and degrees of uh, picturesqueness and so forth, has all together, when you consider it all together, certainly one of the most pervasive American types of architecture. And uh, we could say that maybe it has a particularly, that there's a, something p peculiarly American about the shingle style. One doesn't, it's never been popular in, in, in Europe, uh, for example. There's something, and so why is it, uh, why is it so popular in America? Uh, maybe because it has a, a domestic quality and general informality, this rustic aspect. 
And, um, and so it's uh, something one sees uh, all over. Well, in the late 19th century, many uh, different things were happening in American architecture. It's a period of great complexity and kind of opposing uh, forces. It's a difficult uh, period to make sense out of, but as a result, it's a very interesting period. We have all the different uh, revival styles that we've examined, different forms of the picturesque, uh, including the, the, the shingle style. But then at the same time, there were all sorts of technological developments happening. Use of iron and steel and uh, reinforced concrete beginning. And then especially in the creation of the skyscraper, which uh, is the topic that I'll uh, be looking at um, in the next lecture. Uh, that, but then also there were some architects with highly individual or kind of eccentric styles of their own. And one of these, a man named Frank Furness, I listed on the handout uh, uh, for this week, but have decided not to include because I want to move on. And so I've, he's one of the people I decided to cut. He's a fascinating architect, but one of these eccentric people who really uh, are just off on their, on their own doing, doing their own trip. And um, another one of this sort is Lewis Sullivan, whom we will be looking at next, um, uh, in the next lecture in regard to um, uh, skyscrapers. But there's a different trend uh, that I'd like to examine a bit now. Uh, or a change in taste toward the end of the uh, 19th century, which um, might be um, represented or epitomized best in um, the buildings and the layout of a World's Fair that uh, just, wait a minute, no, actually, that was the one I want on the right there. It's the Chicago World's Fair of 1893 was called the uh, Columbian Exposition because it was, uh, the point of this fair was to celebrate the 400th anniversary of uh, Columbus's uh, discovery of America. They, uh, they missed by one year, so I'm not sure exactly why. They did it in 1893. But um, architecturally, the um, Chicago World's Fair represented a return to classical styles, as you can see, and I'll be looking, I'll uh, show some uh, a couple more slides uh, a, a little later of the of the architecture, which uh, and and to put um, and also represented some some new ideas about uh, about planning and it was important for urban planning of the period, which I will suggest um, toward the end of the lecture. But to put this shift of taste into perspective, I'd like to backtrack just a little bit and say something about the influence of French architecture in America in the late. Uh, late 19th century. And that means saying something about the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, the National French Art School. Uh, and uh, the name uh, is uh, Ecole des Beaux-Arts is spelled out, I believe, on the uh, handout. So you might want to just look at that to see how, it's, uh, uh, how the words are spelled. And the, um, the architecture department at this Ecole des Beaux-Arts, which is the uh, School of Fine Arts, the National uh, School of Fine Arts in France, the architecture department was um, certainly the most prestigious place in the world to study architecture in the uh, in the 19th century and actually into the well into the 20th century. And uh, American architects increasingly went to uh, to study there by about 1900. The um, the Ecole des Beaux Arts is most commonly associated in people's mind with lavish architectural styles like the, uh, the neo-baroque of the Paris Opera that we see here uh, that was built in the, uh, in the 1860s, a, um, an amazing uh, extravaganza conceived uh, largely as a, as a symbol of the cultural and political grandeur of France under the reign of, um, of Napoleon III, what's called the Second Empire. So there were all sorts of uh, of symbolic connotations that, uh, that uh, buildings like this had. And this is what people generally think of when, when they think of the of Beaux-Arts architecture in the, uh, in the 19th century. But it was really only, this is only one side of the, uh, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts and the system that came out of that, which, uh, as I'll suggest, uh, had a, an important influence in America around the turn of the century. More important than that, I think, than, than the specific style of uh, something like the Paris Opera was the whole system of design that was taught at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, which um, stressed 
the orderly and logical planning of buildings and also of urban spaces. It really has, it re has relevance also for, um, for city planning. Uh, these, um, uh, this orderly planning, which then could be executed in just about any style of architecture. Uh, it did not have to be Baroque, uh, as we see on the, um, in, the, in the Paris Opera. And in fact, in some cases, it could be a, a type of architecture which had very a little obvious revival style to it at all. And uh, here we see a building which um, in some ways represents a, a, a different, uh, this different aspect of the uh, Ecole style. This is a library in Paris, the uh, uh, Bibliothèque Sainte Geneviève, that was designed by a graduate of the, uh, of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts that uh, all public buildings in, in, in France at this time would have been designed by people who came out of this school. And it's a very interesting uh, library in many ways, but partly structurally, it ha inside it has a, a, a very, very advanced uh, uh, technology of using iron structure, uh, even though you don't see that from the uh, outside. But it represents a, a much more progressive side of the uh, Beaux-Arts system. So it's, it's hard to um, make generalizations about Beaux-Arts architecture, except that it's usually very orderly in its planning and stresses a kind of uh, public decorum over personal idiosyncrasy. Uh, individuality was, was generally discouraged by, uh, uh, by this system of uh, education and system of architecture. So in general, the, one could say that the influence of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, and this was around the world, uh, throughout Europe and in the United States, uh, it really became almost a kind of worldwide uh, architectural system as uh, architects from around the world came to study in Paris. That was the place in the whole world to go and study architecture. Uh, and its uh, general influence, I think we could say, would be to, was to encourage standards in architecture and in urban design rather than having each building off doing its own thing. So one thing that, was, uh, that the uh, Beaux-Arts system definitely would discourage would be the picturesque. Uh, and individuality and uh, sort of eccentricity in architecture. So it's very different. It's a, a different kind of tendency or um, a trend from most of the things that we've been looking at so far. And that's why, it, and when it started being important in America and making its influence felt, it really uh, uh, changed things in American architecture. Well, as early as the, um, as the 1860s, American, some Americans had begun to go to Paris to study at the, um, at the Ecole. Uh, Richardson, for example, did, but he wasn't the first. The, the first one, apparently, was a man named uh, Richard Morris Hunt, whom I'd like to just look at uh, briefly. Um, he went there in the um, 1860s, I think, uh, early 60s. He, back in the United States, after studying there, he had a, a very successful career and designed um, various kinds of buildings, including an early skyscraper, which I think we'll see um, uh, briefly next uh, time. But his career was mainly based on commissions for houses for the very wealthy. The new class of industrial and commercial capitalists in America who were much richer than uh, any earlier uh, Americans. It was really a, t a totally uh, a new phenomenon of the, the super rich that uh, uh, make their appearance in, uh, in American uh, economic life at this time in the, um, uh, in the late 19th century. And just to suggest the extraordinary wealth of, uh, of the upper class in America at this time, I thought I would show, of all the interesting buildings of uh, Richard Morris Hunt that, uh, that I could show, I picked uh, three buildings uh, of his that were designed all for the same family. And it happens to be the Vanderbilt family, who uh, uh, were based in, uh, in New York, but in other uh, cities in, in the East, whose money had come um, mainly from railroads. And Hunt, Richard Morris Hunt, was the Vanderbilt's favorite uh, architect. On the left, we see one of their New York houses. This uh, was in a kind of French medieval style. The house is no longer in, ex in existence, so that's why we only know it from these um, old black and white photographs. And on, on the right is uh, a country house of theirs. They had a number of country houses. This one is uh, uh, Biltmore. Their house in uh, North Carolina, both of these are from the 1880s, 
And uh, Biltmore is in a, it's hard to really describe the style. It's some kind of a combination of different French styles, uh, some medieval, some uh, more Renaissance. Uh, French styles especially were popular at this time. The, uh, the cachet or prestige of anything French uh, in the late 19th century began to uh, influence even the styles that people would build things in, at least on these, this kind of upper uh, class level. The, um, this house is immense, uh, and you, we're, not, we're only seeing part of it uh, in this uh, photograph. And uh, the grounds, or there are extensive grounds as well, which happen to have been laid out, at least partly laid out, by Olmsted at just about the time he was designing um, uh, Stanford, toward the end of his career. But probably the most amazing of these Vanderbilt houses is uh, the other, the third one I want to look at, which is um, called the Breakers. And it's um, their house at Newport, Rhode Island. Now, by this time in the late 19th century, Newport had become the uh, favorite uh, summer resort of the super wealthy on the, on the East Coast and especially uh, the New York, um, New York families. And this was the, um, uh, or actually one of the Vanderbilt's houses in uh, Newport, a uh, rather nice piece of real estate there right on the, uh, on, the, on the coast, built in the 1890s. This um, uh, more in an Italian Renaissance uh, type of style maybe, but with these uh, buildings, I don't think that the specific styles matter that much. Um, the way they did uh, matter, for example, in the case of the Greek Revival or the Gothic Revival, where, where styles really had some uh, meaning uh, because of the connotations that went along with them. Where in the Greek Revival, can, associated with democracy and, uh, and then with downing and the, and the picturesque cottage, um, of uh, these styles having, having significance and, and expressing underlying <laughs> ideas. In this case, you can't say whether it was in the French medieval style or Italian Renaissance style in these houses of the Vanderbilt really didn't make any difference. They're almost interchangeable styles. They all have the same meaning, we might say, which was the conspicuous display of, of wealth. You might almost call, call them all sort of the, the capitalist style, maybe. And on the left there, you see the, um, the entry hall in, uh, at, at the breakers. It's a, a huge space, lavishly decorated, as you can see with the amazing uh, gilt uh, decoration. Uh, and with the stairway that rises up and then com comes to a landing up here, uh, divides and goes up on, on each side to this, uh, to this upper level, the, uh, the hallway up there. It's a form of, of, of formal uh, uh, stairway type that was originally created for Baroque royal palaces in, in Europe, where processions and entrances were of ritual importance for the, uh, for the royal family and for a royal court. And, and th this, so these houses are now being planned with these spaces that really go back to and originally uh, had meaning because they were uh, for royal ritual. And uh, and it's, uh, it seems clear that these uh, families were, um, were acting out, in a sense, a kind of pretense that they were royalty. Uh, in a sense, maybe they, maybe they were the new American uh, royalty. And um, so it's, uh, these, these rooms are just extraordinary at the Breakers, and it's uh, been perfectly preserved. It's wonderful, and it's open to the public, of course. If you, oh, before we go ahead, I want to go back to that uh, uh, aerial view that shows the breakers, but you can see that uh, that there are other similar houses here. Some of them little little cottages, uh, but uh, others of these uh, immense houses. And uh, it is the most amazing place to uh, to visit. And a lot of them are open to the uh, to the public. And uh, a trip to to Newport to look at these houses is really uh, gives one an amazing insight into uh, upper class the upper classes in the late 19th century in America. Here's one of their dining rooms in the Breakers. And again, it's really something out of a, uh, a European royal palace, where the, the kind of decoration that uh, would have been created for Louis XIV to, uh, to dine. We have to remember that this is just a, uh, one of the Vanderbilt summer houses. And here there is the music room. In the billiard room, nice little informal billiard room there. So um, 
It's a, uh, it's a f far cry, obviously, from uh, from Downing's ideal of a democratic architecture for for America, is the expressing the Republican virtues, as he stated. We have a completely different phenomenon here, and certainly these uh, houses suggest as much about social issues in America around 1900 as, as about architectural issues. As I suggested, the, the specific styles almost don't matter here. Well, shortly after designing this uh, house for the Vanderbilts, uh, drawing certainly on certain uh, on, on, on principles of the, the Beaux-Arts system that he had learned when he studied in Paris, Richard Morris Hunt died and his place as the most fashionable architect in America was uh, taken by a, a firm of three young architects whom I want to look at briefly, who are interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, the firm called McKim, Mead, and White, who for many decades were probably the most successful architects in the country. And here we see, uh, see them in a later photograph. Obviously, they're not so young there. Uh, but they they practiced for many decades, well into the uh, into the 20th century, and um, are of interest partly because they uh, are really the prototype for the modern American architectural firm, in which several architects come together, not just practicing individually, but uh, uh, create a, a a firm with the the principal partners. In this case, the three of them. Uh, um, organized efficiently, the offices w office with a large uh, staff, each person in the office having his own area of, of expertise. So this efficient organization of, uh, of an architectural office, and really this is their, their firm is the prototype of uh, this. In this case, the, um, these um, uh, uh, positions or the uh, responsibilities were divided up in such a way that uh, uh, that Meade, William Meade was his name, and he's in the center there, was the older of them, uh, was the, um, mainly the engineer and businessman. Uh, so he dealt with those issues and, uh, and not with design itself for the most part. Uh, that was uh, Charles McKim and Stanford White were the two others uh, in the firm, and they were in charge of design. But even there, they d divided it up. Uh, Stanford White, who is, I think, on the, on the right there, um, was uh, tended to specialize in interior design and domestic houses more, whereas McKim on the left, who was the um, who had studied at the Ecole des Beaux Arts, was mainly uh, designed their larger public buildings. And both um, McKim and White had also worked in H. H. Richardson's office before setting up their own uh, firm with uh, with Mead. Their early work was. Um, was largely in, in the shingle style, and in fact, they helped create this uh, the shingle style along with H.H. Uh, Richardson. And let me show um, quickly uh, two or three of their shingle style buildings because they're very interesting. Uh, this is uh, one called the Newport Casino. It's in Newport, Rhode Island, built around 1880, that um, combines uh, shops on the street and then the clubhouse, the casino part of it, uh, the, uh, behind the um, uh, the street facade, uh, but the whole thing uh, creating a kind of unified design, but also giving a domestic scale and variety, a very, very original design for combining commercial space and a, um, and, uh, and a, um, some kind of a public space. And it's a design that has uh, inspired a lot of contemporary architects recently. A lot of postmodern uh, architects look back to and study the, the work like this and other um, of uh, uh, shingle style and other work of this period. It's, uh, it's a type of architecture that has, um, is enjoying a, a great revival of interest among practicing architects these days. <clears throat> and in the 1880s and 90s, McKim, Mead, and White did many houses in the shingle style, but very, each one slightly different and very original. So let me show, show two of them that are very different. Uh, here's a house in, in Newport, also another one of these Newport houses called the Bell House from the 1880s that is a, a, a kind of extreme example of these picturesque aspects of a lot of variety, different uh, forms, lots of, of gables in the house. And the plan also, you can see, is, uh, ver is very irregular and kind of meanders around. The rooms are, are very open to one another. Now you can see there's a, uh, there's a large opening between the dining room and the, uh, and the hall or living room. 
And um, all of these things are to be important for later architects like Frank Lloyd Wright. But then the opposite tendency can also be found uh, uh, in, um, in McKim, Mead, and White's uh, shingle-style houses of more unified uh, designs. And the fa my favorite of these, a really extraordinary design, is a building called the Low House. It's the William Low House in um, Bristol, Rhode Island from 1887, which is really one of the most uh, amazing designs of this period. It almost it looks like it could, have, could be a contemporary house today. And it's one of these things that contemporary architects really uh, have, uh, are inspired by in, um, in recent years. The whole house now unified under one roof, everything, and yet there's still a, 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 a slight suggestion of irregularity and picturesque things like these bay windows that that give the facade a kind of irregularity. And there's a porch. All of these picturesque houses had to have porches. But look what the way they, the porch is treated. It's, it's tucked under this uh, roof. So the roof even en encompasses the, uh, the porch. It's um, one of the most original and, uh, and striking designs of, uh, of American architecture, maybe of any period. And unfortunately, no longer exists. It was torn down a few years ago, a great loss. <clears throat> well, by this time, in the, around um, uh, 1890 or so, McKim, Mead, and White were beginning to do designs that, um, that had a Beaux-Arts character. And this was uh, partly because of there was a kind of emerging interest in, uh, in the Beaux-Arts at this time, but also because they began to get larger commissions and public commissions for which classical Beaux-Arts architecture was um, more appropriate. And the uh, first of these, the first major building, is, um, was a library. The Boston Public Library, it still is the Boston Public Library, of, uh, uh, which they began designing in 1887. And um, it's typical of the, uh, the large public buildings that American cities were beginning to uh, erect at this time as cities became more concerned with municipal services and a general kind of sense of, of civic mindedness. And the Boston Public Library sort of sums this up and became a, a, a prototype in many ways or inspired other cities to build impressive uh, public buildings and libraries in a similar manner. Now McKim was um, in charge of the Boston Public Library project and he was in clearly inspired. He was the one who had actually studied at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts and I think he clearly was inspired by that library we saw before, briefly. The Bibliothèque Sainte Genevieve in uh, Paris. Not so much on the outside, though there certainly you can see similarities, these, uh, these, these arches that extend across the whole length of the outside. Well, yeah, the more I look at that certainly is, there certainly are great similarities there. But it's more important probably was the plan that he took, the interior plan. And I don't have a, a slide of the plan, but I can describe simply what it is because it's very, a very uh, simple idea which was that for a library like this, and this was a, a type of plan that the, um, that the Ecole des Beaux-Arts had developed for, for libraries. There was a sense of, of logic and order in the Beaux-Arts system so that for each um, building uh, uh, type or uh, function, it was considered that there would be one appropriate type of plan. It was uh, sometimes called a parti in French. And, um, and for libraries, they had worked out a system where the building would be uh, long in this direction, the entrance would be in the center of the long side, and then you'd go in and there'd be a kind of entrance hall and a stair that would go up and usually divide and come back to, uh, and, and, and to, um, to the reading room, which it was on the second floor, a large reading room uh, uh, along the front, and then uh, uh, the books would be stored and there'd be offices on the lower floor. And this is exactly the same plan, and it works very, it's a very logical plan for a, uh, for a library if you want a large reading room, which was, uh, is now perhaps not so important in, in libraries, but was at that time. And um, so uh, uh, McKim uses the same plan for the Boston Public Library, the great entrance hall, and then the stairs that go up and divide and come back and, and, and uh, provide access to the, to the reading room across the front. And it was uh, uh, recognized as such a logical pattern for a library that it became the standard plan for public libraries in America for many uh, years, uh, well into the 20th century. And one can find examples of it all over. The, um, the uh, San Francisco Library, the um, old library, which has just been replaced by the, uh, the new one, uh, it, it had exactly that same uh, pattern. And even the old Stanford Library, Old Green, 
uh, even though the proportions of the overall building are not the same, it was the um, and is the same uh, plan that inside. And when this is when uh, Green Library is eventually rebuilt, whenever that is, uh, the uh, you'll be able to 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 go in and see this uh, this plan where you go in. Uh, there's uh, uh, an imposing entrance hall with a stair that goes up and divides and comes back, and then with a reading room in the front on the second level. So um, this became the standard pattern for um, for libraries in America, clearly coming out of this uh, Beaux Arts system of of logical planning. One other view of the Boston Public Library: the reading room, uh, typical Beaux Arts public space, meant to be. Uh, uh, noble and uh, inspire a kind of civic pride and to symbolize cultural heritage and so forth. In this case, based on, uh, uh, on Roman vaulted uh, spaces. The sort of building that um, are coming to be appreciated again of in the, our period of postmodernism, when there's a kind of revival of interest in the, in the Beaux-Arts. This is a style that, that until uh, uh, recently, until recent decades, was pretty much uh, dismissed by modern architects as being uh, irrelevant to uh, uh, to the to modern architecture. But um, now, more uh, more and more, contemporary architects are looking back at these buildings and uh, and, be, and appreciating their uh, uh, their qualities. The um, the Beaux Arts was at its best probably in this type of large public buildings, and the largest of these by McKim, Mead, and White was a railroad station in, um, in New York that I want to look at briefly here. Pennsylvania Station, uh, designed starting in 1902. It was a very complex uh, program, as you can imagine, involving uh, urban planning as well as, uh, as just a, a building. Uh, the, the, the trains had to, be, had to come in, of course, on tracks that were on the lower uh, level. Uh, and then uh, there had to be a uh, proper kind of accommodation for uh, people meeting the trains, waiting rooms, uh, intricate circulation problems, as you can imagine, both pedestrian and uh, vehicular traffic on the city levels as well as the trains that come in. And it was a typical kind of Beaux-Arts solution to the problem here, logically planned circulation with large, grand uh, spaces for the major functions, the train shed where the trains actually came in, and then the way the, the uh, public waiting room, this uh, part that uh, extends up here, the grand uh, space. We show these two main spaces, the, uh, the train shed, where steel and iron is used, wi widely uh, used now uh, by this time, by the turn of the century, uh, steel construction. But the waiting room, even though it's uh, the uh, underlying structure, probably has a lot of steel in it, does not, oops, that's not what I wanted to have there, is, um, Here's the waiting room of, uh, of the Pennsylvania Station that has that uh, style of uh, imposing architecture more like the uh, reading room of the uh, Boston Public Library. McKim, Mead, and White recognized that the train station was the modern equivalent, really, of the entry gates to uh, a city. This is how, where people came uh, to the city and had their first impression of a city, and therefore, they wanted to create a space that proclaims the nobility and the grandeur of the uh, city. It has, uh, uh, it, it's supposed to give a message. And in this case, also compare it to, uh, compare it to ancient Rome and Roman civilization, because the, the actual architecture of this waiting room was based on the Roman baths of uh, Caracalla, a specific source. And um, so it's the, uh, the Beaux-Arts at its most, um, effective in terms of symbolism and, and propaganda, even, we might say. And another one of the uh, unfortunate uh, facts of uh, uh, American architectural preservation is that in 1964, Pennsylvania Station was torn down. The, uh, uh, these great monumental spaces no longer made sense from an economic point of view for the uh, railroad to, um, to maintain. And, uh, but there was, it was after a great uh, preservation fight, but uh, the preservation is lost and it was torn down. And uh, the um, hi uh, historian, Vincent Scully, who was involved in the efforts to try to save it, after it was torn down, he wrote about, the, about it and contrasted the nobility of these spaces, of the, these Beaux-Arts uh, monumental spaces, 
with con contrasted them with the cramped and nasty terminal facilities that uh, replaced them for Pennsylvania Station and, and wrote the following. I just love this quote. He said, one used to enter New York in triumph like a god. Now one scuttles in like a rat. And it, it suggests uh, the, the value in some ways of the, um, of the Beaux-Arts system and this idea of, 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 of architecture to create an impression, a public impression, uh, create civic pride and so forth. The kinds of aspects that people are now rethinking and looking more favorably at the Beaux-Arts. Just one more design by, um, by McKim, Mead and White uh, in New York City, the uh, Washington Square Arch. Another of, uh, uh, example of this new interest in public urban monuments, which uh, in their consistent classical order suggest a kind of unified civic responsibility. Though, of course, American society was by no means unified uh, at this uh, time with class conflict and um, union struggles and so forth. So this perhaps represented more of a, of a dream or an ideal, a call for civic order rather than s expressing reality that could be seen as utopian in these day, ways. These principles of classicism and order were applied also to city planning on a large scale, and this is the final subject I want to look at briefly, and led to what's called the City Beautiful Movement. And this was given its greatest impetus by that Chicago World's Fair that I showed briefly before. So now we'll return um, uh, to this, of, of 1893, which established a kind of model for many Americans of what an orderly planned classical city should look like with large public spaces arranged along axes and cross axes with focal points and uh, impressive buildings and monuments, usually classical in style, of course. This uh, fair, the Chicago World's Fair, was planned not by one person, but by a, a, a committee, as, as World's Fairs often are. But it included Olmsted for the, uh, he was involved in this a bit. This was really toward the end of his career, and he was, um, wasn't uh, well at this time. But the, he, he was a, an advisor, a consultant on it. And uh, especially a man named Daniel Burnham was a planner, and we'll see more of him next time. Another uh, model for American planners at this time was the city of Paris itself especially those parts laid out by, uh, under Napoleon Bonaparte and then later by Napoleon III uh, in the Second Empire period. For example, the, um, the Champs-Élysées and uh, the Arc de Triomphe, uh, which uh, was a kind of 19th century reinterpretation of those Baroque planning principles of axes and focal points and here streets radiating out from, from this uh, monument. So these things started now to influence American city planning in, uh, in various ways. And Daniel Burnham, who uh, was a Chicago architect and one of the uh, planners, as I mentioned, of the uh, Chicago World's Fair, became a leading uh, proponent of these, this so-called city beautiful movement in, um, in America. And he, designed, he was hired by a number of cities to um, to redesign the cities to introduce these uh, principles and uh, create these kinds of spaces. He did a major uh, design for replanning um, uh, Chicago uh, 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 that involved many different uh, plans for buildings and spaces and was published as a book. This was done from about 1905 to 10. And um, he uh, uh, proposed many improvements for Chicago, new parks along uh, uh, Lake Michigan and uh, new um, traffic patterns. Um, cutting uh, uh, boulevards through that uh, grid of the old Chicago, which uh, remember we saw an aerial bird's eye view of before where I, every square inch was built up with uh, uh, private enterprise. So this is a completely different, uh, a new idea of cities taking, uh, making these, um, these physical improvements, focal points, civic uh, buildings. Only some of it, however, was executed. And this tended to be the problem with many of these city beautiful plans. They looked great on paper, but uh, in reality, often very little of it got, uh, got really executed. And uh, I wanted to conclude now with uh, an aspect of this closer to home, because in 1905, uh, uh, Burnham was uh, hired by the city of San Francisco, actually starting in 1902, but he worked on it until 1905, to make uh, plans for San Francisco in this Beaux-Arts spirit of the City Beautiful movement. And here we see, it's a little hard to see maybe, but uh, this is a, uh, an aerial drawing of, um, 
Uh, looking down at San Francisco, this is the Golden Gate Bridge up here, so this is, this is north, and we would, Stanford would be down this way. Uh, but here's the whole city of San Francisco with um, uh, Market Street, uh, let's see, going, uh, where is, no, Market Street here, I just turned around. Market Street, the, uh, the, uh, the, the grid of, of, uh, of, of uh, San Francisco, the way it was laid out, and then all sorts of, of uh, improvements that uh, Burnham was suggesting for parks and boulevards. And on the right, we see one of these where he was planning a civic center uh, that was to have uh, uh, a monument with these radiating streets. You can see it comes right from these uh, Parisian kinds of Beaux-Arts principles. There was to be a great uh, opera house uh, building here that clearly looks like the uh, is inspired by the Paris Opera. Well, as in many cases, uh, this was this, uh, these plans of uh, Burnham did not have much effect in San Francisco. The earthquake uh, uh, came the following year in 1906, and you would think that it might have been a perfect uh, opportunity to put a great plan like this into effect. But it didn't happen for uh, reasons that are kind of interesting to, uh, to speculate about. And uh, so the, uh, the effects in San Francisco were not as great as Burnham had hoped, but still there are vestiges of this plan in, uh, in San Francisco today, the, certainly the most important of which is the Civic Center area with the City Hall. That's also a perfect example of Beaux-Arts architecture in its, uh, uh, in, um, its uh, monumentality and the, and the style and its focal position it takes the uh, Opera House and the War Memorial Auditorium. And in fact, the um, San Francisco uh, City Hall and Civic Center complex is one of the, um, the best examples in an American city of these Beaux-Arts principles of, of city planning and of the city beautiful movement. But um, Daniel Burnham was also one of the pioneers of the skyscraper. And here we see one of the skyscrapers that will uh, lead into our look at uh, at the creation of the American skyscraper when we pick up on Tuesday. <laughs>